George is currently the medical director for NHS 24 and is the director of the Scottish Center for Telehealth and Telecare. He's responsible for a delivery of all NHS 24 clinical services and the development of new services in partnership with other NHS organizations. Leading the Scottish Center for Telehealth and Telecare, he's responsible for the development and delivery of national telehealth services. He's also the president of uh, the European Telematics Association and leads the Integrated Care Action Group of the European Innovation Partnership for Active and Healthy Aging for the European Commission. Uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, also briefly say George has a background as a... Uh, a general practitioner uh, in, in Scotland as well. And uh, we'll uh, hand this over to George now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much and uh, welcome to Scotland. First of all, I would like to say thank you. You are obviously the most discerning audience uh, here at this event because you have chosen to come to this session. And if you know any of the nine people that left before I started to talk, just tell them what they missed, even if you don't like me. Okay. As a physician, if you heap guilt on your patients, it makes you feel so much better. What I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit about Scotland. Uh, we have a population of 5.2 million uh, people, um, and the NHS in Scotland is the same as the rest of the UK in that our service is free at the point of delivery. However, that is where the similarity ends. England is going down uh, a route of improving quality uh, using the forces of the internal market. Scotland is going down a different route. Uh, we are basically a benign Stalinist society. So we are looking at the principles of mutuality, partnership, and performance, but performance based on quality outcomes. Now, Scotland actually is a microcosm. We have got every problem you could conceive that any healthcare system in the developed world has. We have got urban and post-industrial cities. The east end of Glasgow um, has got a mortality rate that no one should be proud of. And we have got challenges of remoteness and rurality. And we've got also a number of islands. In fact, the island of Shetland is closer to Norway than it actually is um, to mainland Scotland. So there are challenges on how we deliver an integrated system. However, our healthcare uh, is provided by delivery organisations called health boards. And in Scotland, um, our health system is vertically integrated. In other words, we have a complete integration between hospital and community health services that are run by our territorial health boards. And we are moving towards that nirvana um, of horizontal integration, which is the integration of health and social care. And that will be enshrined in law. There is a law going through the Scottish Parliament at the moment that will make uh, it a law of the land that we have to integrate uh, health and social care. But we are pushing that line further because that horizontal in, uh, integration is involving the patient, the family and carers, and industry. And that, we believe, is the key for the survival of our health and care system. Now, just a very little bit about my organization, NHS 24, because if I didn't do this, my chief executive would not give me my performance-related pay. So if any strange guy comes in and says, did he mention NHS 24, say yes. We are a statutory health board. Um, however, we do not cover a small part of Scotland. We cover the whole 5.2 million of our citizens. And we are the national provider of telehealth and telecare services to the population of Scotland. And we are quite unique. Um, there is no other health system in Europe that has got a national provider uh, like ourselves. But in fact, we've got a very small budget. Um, the total budget for the health uh, healthcare sector in Scotland is approaching 12 billion uh, pounds. Uh, the budget of my organization uh, is no longer 62 million. We managed uh, to increase that to about 75 million, but it's actually small in terms, in real terms. That's a map of Scotland. Um, these are our geographical health boards. We actually managed to get Shetland on the top of the map. Um, and this is the location of my organization. We have four main principal centers in red. And you can see, however, we have got a presence geographically 
in every health board. Now, we are a technology organization. All these service centers are linked up into a single virtual ICT network. And this is what we do. Now, we provide health and care services using every digital channel available to us. Telephone services, web-based services, high-end telemedicine, services using mobile devices, digital television, which I'll talk a little about later on. You can tell I'm not actually built for television, darlings, but uh, digital television services. And we do home monitoring. So in the beginning, we were a contact center business. When the family doctor services closed at 6 o'clock at night, um, my organization came into action and we answered the phone for every family doctor in Scotland. So during the out-of-hours period and at weekends and on holidays, we catered for all the needs of the 5.2 million citizens providing telephone assessment and triage. Now what is interesting is the telephone has been around for a long, long time. But the reality is still the vast majority of healthcare systems do not even use that technology to its maximum to service the needs of its patients, its service users, and its citizens. Our organization, however, has evolved. And now we provide services using every digital channel. However, we only use these services when it is safe, effective, and appropriate to do so. Just because you can do something with technology does not mean you should do it. And what do we use our technology for? That one at the bottom. Face-to-face -face care is the most important and valued asset in any health and care system in the world. It is also the most expensive asset to deploy. And what we need to do with technology and what we are doing in Scotland is using technology to protect face-to-face -face services, to increase its availability to our citizens so that when they truly need it, they can access it. Now, for any woman in the audience, you will know when a man is sick, he has to tell someone how sick he is. It is part of the healing process there's a number of women in the audience know that. That's the reality. So we have to recognize that you can't use technology all the time. For all of us, we need that face-to-face -face contact. So we heard from our last speaker, and I'm going to really support most of what he said, is that we have to make sure the service redesign is appropriate to our needs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The world is changing. Does anybody recognize who this is in the top? It's, yeah, it's the cast of The Sound of Music. And that was them at the time of the original film, and that is them just last year. Now, you can see they have changed, particularly the 17-year-old girl who was third in from the top, who was Liesl, for those who remember. You can tell she's got osteoporosis. She's lost about four inches in height, poor girl. Some of the others are vaguely recognizable, but um, hey -ho. Why have I shown this? We are constantly changing. We change physically, we change psychologically, we change how we interact with our world. The tragedy is, does that link to the use of ICT and technology? I would suspect the way you use technology in your social life and the way you use technology in your work life are two completely different things. You will step back 7, 10, or 15 years when you move into the office. In the UK, as across most of Europe, we ban our young doctors from using social media. Why do we do that? Oh, we talk about patient confidentiality and safely. That's not true. The reason it is banned is because we, this generation, do not understand it. It is an incredibly powerful source of good. It is actually the way we're going to educate and train the clinicians of the future. It is the way we will drive quality improvement. We need to better understand things rather than getting rid of them. That's one of the original Apple computers. It's a nice little model that came out of the garage uh, in San Francisco. And technology has changed radically 
over the last 10 to 15 years. In fact, 75% of Apple's profits come from two gadgets that weren't actually invented eight years ago. So when people ask me to do presentations of forecasting what is the future of ICT going to be in 10 years' time, I have to tell them I have not got a clue. We don't know. Interesting. What does it mean? It actually means we have to change the way we deliver health and care, as our previous <coughs> speaker said. These are things that you will all recognize. This is common across Europe and all developed health and care systems. We have got that demographic challenge that is here today. We've got the increase in chronic conditions. We have got a lack of health care professionals. When you add to that the financial instability across most of the developed world and the fact that all public sector services are under significant pressure, and that's not going to change probably during all of our lifetimes in this room. And the issue that was also mentioned earlier, health inequalities. Health inequalities is a reality that we cannot ignore. Longevity is increasing. But longevity isn't important for me. It's actually about healthy life years. The fact you live to 105 dependent with a very poor quality of life is not anything we should be striving towards. It is about living a healthy, active, and connected life. And a little bit about, more about that in a minute. If you learn nothing else from my presentation, remember that. Because it's going to affect us all. The number of people requiring care is going to increase. And the number available to deliver that care is going to reduce. And we need to, therefore, address how we are going to deliver uh, care uh, with that challenge. In Scotland, that is our vision. We are probably one of the few healthcare systems that actually puts its aspiration on one single slide. The important bits are the bits in red. It's about living longer, healthier lives at home. It's about the integration of health and social care, focusing on prevention, anticipation, and supported self-management, although we've actually moved even further than that. What we're also saying is hospitals are damn dangerous places. Mind you, the nursing home that Oscar is in seems quite dangerous as well. I actually thought when I heard that that maybe Oscar is killing the people. Just a thought. Anyway, if you do need to go into hospital, it will be for as short a time as possible, and we'll look to get you back into your own home or a homely setting uh, with a minimal risk of readmission. Now, no one could argue with any of those principles. How achievable are they without redesigning our services? Actually, I would uh, argue they're not. So for us, this is the key. It's about integration. It's about changing the way we transact business in healthcare and between health and social care from arguments about whose budget is going to be used to pay for services through to sweetness and light. It's not like that at Scotland in the moment, but we're trying to move towards it. One of the things that we've done is we established the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare. Uh, it's an organisation that I'm responsible for. And basically what we're there to do is actually to drive forward a number of initiatives. We had more pilots in telehealth and telehealth and telecare than British Airways has. And what we said nationally is we're going to stop those. We had about 194, 220 pilots. We said we're going to stop those. We are going to focus on four national programs. And that's what we did, and we've delivered those four national programs. And we're now moving uh, on to the next stage. We have got an overarching e-health strategy, but below that, uh, we had a strategy specifically for telehealth and a second one for telecare. Now, telecare from a Scottish perspective, is environmental and home monitoring. So um, uh, movement sensors, uh, smoke detectors, gas detectors, flood detectors, those things that, in fact, can keep a frail, vulner vulnerable, elderly person independent in their own home. And our strategy, as you will see there, ran till 2012, but it wasn't just in paper. The Scottish government, with a bit of persuasion, decided they would invest in this. And they set up a reshaping care program, which was about redesigning how we delivered services. 
and they earmarked £300 million uh, over five years uh, to actually reshape care using ICT when it was safe, effective and appropriate to do so. So the strategy was due for renewal in 2012 and I went to Scottish Government because I wrote the strategy uh, and said, um, do you want another strategy? And I had a 30-minute meeting with the chief executive of the NHS in Scotland and after 30 minutes we agreed we did not want to write another strategy. It wasn't that my initial strategy was poor, actually it wasn't particularly uh, inventive. We actually decided we wanted a national delivery plan. No more strategies. So we wrote a national delivery plan for telehealth and telecare in Scotland and it has been signed up formally by Scottish Government, by the Health Service in Scotland and that group in the middle are our local authorities who in fact at the moment deliver social care. So in fact we have got targets for the use of ICT to support our citizens and I just want to share three or four things that are in that strategy. What we said was, telehealth and telecare will enable choice and control. And that control is given to our citizens. And we will deploy it to touch the lives of 300,000 more of our citizens. People will increasingly demand telehealth and telecare and see it as a positive option through education and training. We would establish an innovation centre for digital health, uh, which we have, and fortuitously, I'm chairman of the Digital uh, Health Innovation Centre uh, for Scotland. I think I'm going for world domination next. Um, and then we said we wanted to develop an international reputation for research. Now, where I also agree with the previous speaker is randomised control trials have got no place in the evaluation of home monitoring digital solutions. The whole system demonstrator, which some of you may have heard of um, uh, in UK, uh, actually proved two things. First of all, it showed that randomised control trials don't work, um, because clearly, as was said, the solution you deploy into a home in day one, and the solution that will be working after month six or month nine, will be different. That's the nature of all technology deployments. The second thing the whole system demonstrator said was, telehealth is more expensive. And it absolutely is. If you stick it on top of conventional services and you don't redesign how you're delivering the core service. And that's what happened. Not surprising it was more expensive. You have to redesign and insert the ICT as part of that innovative service redesign. So our digital uh, health delivery plan basically says this. Keep it simple. We overcomplicate and we overengineer. We run certain digital services across the most expensive uh, broadband networks when a bit of copper wire would do, and we wonder why it's expensive. Marry the solution to the problem. Don't over-specify. In Scotland, we're going to use three pieces of kit to interact with our citizens in the future. We're going to use smartphones, we're going to use tablet computers, and we're going to use digital television. Why digital television? Well, interestingly, for this reason, we have got a problem in Scotland with broadband uh, 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 connectivity. If you're over 65 in Scotland and you come from a lower socioeconomic group, there's a less than 45% chance you will have broadband in your home. However, due to the marketing power of um, our satellite broadcasters, particularly Sky, and this wonderful individual some of you have heard of called Rupert Murdoch, 80% of social housing in Scotland has satellite or cable television. In fact, it is true that the size of your television screen in your house is inversely proportional to the household income. Sad fact, in Scotland, people have got the full digital television package and they can't afford to put fresh fruit and vegetables on the table for their children. Should we be upset about that? Yes, we should. But in fact, we can exploit it because we can push and pull health information to and from that big television in the corner of our room very simply and very inexpensively. So in Scotland, you can make your GP appointment through your television. You can order your prescriptions through your television. You can interact with a health and care service in a number of ways. We need to be smart. So that's what we've done. 
placed ICT in its place. The most important thing for us is education and training. Not simply education and training of clinicians, but education and training of patients and informal carers. But the key is service redesign. Because if you get service redesign wrong, we've all done that. So focus on the redesign of service. We're actually moving from supportive self-management through to true co-production, where technology actually supports our citizens to deliver their own care, supported by their informal carer network, with the formal health and care system supporting them to do that. Now, that is a major shift. We haven't achieved it yet, but we are moving in that direction because this is a major driver for us. We've also invested in stratifying our population. We have got an outcome tool called SPARA. Don't ask me what it stands for, but SPARA is a little, uh, little bird. We've got 5.2 million of a population. Over 3 million of the population are stratified on a monthly basis. We can identify with 95% certainty uh, the population who are likely to be admitted to hospital at some point uh, in the next year. And we can focus our efforts towards managing those. Now, what we have done, like everywhere else, is manage the top of the Kaiser pyramid. But actually, where a health and care system will really get its main gain is managing the middle. Because we need to create capacity in our health and care system to allow more care to move from hospital into the community, which needs our family doctor service to have that capacity. And moving to a co-production model can take some activities that at the moment are done by health and care professionals in the family doctor service and allow the patients to do it themselves. We also recognize that patients don't stay still. We need to deploy a technology solution that will manage an acute uh, exacerbation of an illness when it happens, but promote well-being when people are well. We are also no longer going to deploy a single technology solution for a single problem. And it won't simply manage health. We will use the same technology solution to connect people to their communities, which is fundamentally important. We also recognize this. Home monitoring solutions look absolutely wonderful in a hospital and clinical setting, but when you put them into people's homes, they look much less attractive. If we take quality and safety as a given, the next thing we're being pushed towards is efficiency and productivity. So mobile technologies, as was mentioned earlier, is another area that we are going down. We were actually enabling uh, our staff to connect easier, not simply with their host organization without having to return to base, but with the patients that they serve. So before we did all of this, we actually went and spoke to the citizens of Scotland. And as a doctor, I was surprised by the answers we got. This is what people in Scotland wanted. They wanted to give things back to their community. They wanted to care for others, but found it very difficult to do so because they were working full time or there was distance between them and their loved ones. They recognized the resilience in communities. They liked the stories of when there was a flood or when there was heavy snow, how everyone got together and they helped their neighbors. But actually, they wanted that to happen all the time. They wanted to share their skills and experience with others. And more importantly, they wanted to be connected to their communities. And they wanted technology. But they wanted to understand it. And they wanted it to be simple to use. Now, ICT can deliver all of these things if you just take the time. So, for example, a piece of technology that goes into someone's home to manage their um, cardiac failure, their diabetes, their hypertension, with a little bit of thought, can allow them to Skype with their family. I'm not talking about Skyping with your relatives in New Zealand. I'm talking about Skyping with your daughter in the same town. That feeling of connectivity. We've got a 92-year-old lady who was frail and housebound, who we connected to her local high school. And she participated in an education session when she taught our 18-year-olds what it was like to cook for a family of six after the Second World War when there was rationing. That did more for the well-being of that woman than three months of antidepressants or 150 doctor visits. Was it expensive to do? Absolutely not. 
Did it transform that woman's life? Yes, it did. And this is the project that's doing this. It's called Living It Up. We are co-designing um, how we deliver health initially for 55,000 people by 2015. It's all about increasing choice, giving control back to the patient and the service users. It's about connecting people to the community, but it's about collaboration. This project would not happen if it was designed and built simply by health and care professionals, and it's about contributions coming from everywhere, particularly from the community. And that is our service model. It has the person at the centre of things, but connecting them to their family and friends and connecting them to their community because this is the future sustainability of our health and care system. It is about unlocking the invisible resources that we in formal health and care ignore. That is the creativity, skills and experience within individual patients and their informal caring network. It's unlocking that resource about the willingness communities have of giving back and helping each other. And it's actually about technology. Collaboration is the key for success, and the reason this is here is we have two pandas uh, in Edinburgh. Um, the issue is, are they, is one pregnant or is it not? Well, between you and I, I don't think it is, but it's still kidding us on. In fact, there are more pandas in Edinburgh than we have Conservative members of Parliament, which is the other joke we usually get in at this point. But collaboration is going to be key for success. And these are the collaborators in the Living It Up project. We've got health providers, we've got local authorities, we have large multinational uh, companies, and we have SMEs all working together. But the other thing that's important, quite like this, I mean, you don't see how worried that lion is looking, is innovation. Innovation is key for success, but innovation is not about technology and boxes. In public services, innovation is about service redesign. It's about how we do things. We need to innovate to survive. And in Scotland, we have the Digital Health and Care Innovation Programme Board, which has been formally constructed to make it easier for us to unlock that invisible resource that's within our staff to innovate across the health and care system. And I'm not going to bore you with the objectives, but we also set up this centre. This centre is bringing together our academic base, industry, and our delivery organisations, all working together in partnership to sponsor digital health innovation. And we firmly believe this will be an engine room for change as we move forward over the next years. And clearly, we are a region in Europe, but Scotland is a nation, as you all know. But we have to learn and share our experiences with each other. And this event is one way of doing it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, George. It's interesting to share this session with you. As I come from Texas, a lot of my colleagues think we're a, a, a nation as well. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? I, I have an initial one. but uh, So uh, either John or uh, George, could you com comment on uh, use of uh, uh, shared decision-making tools, informed decision-making tools related to preference-sensitive care and uh, how with uh, I, uh, either of the uh, organizational approaches you described, there might be some experience with that and the, the potential to uh, help uh, improve health outcomes, improve satisfaction with care and addressing the uh, cost of care as well. Uh, I'll, I'll have a shot at this. Um, uh, David, when, when you say preference-sensitive care, is this a, a diplomatic phrase for when patient, to encourage patients and providers to really question whether they need the test or the treatment, the um, choosing wisely? Uh, there, there, there would be a, well, Actually, I'm talking specifically about a, a, where there's a range of therapeutic options uh, that are mainly driven by the patient's mm. utilities for mm. different health outcomes. Yeah. Well, um, the, uh, the research that I've looked at, uh, at this is there are that, not that many where there are 
those sorts of choices, often it's surgery or medic medical treatment or waiting. Um, and the decision, there are some examples of decision support that are useful for patients, and the UK has, has done some on that. Um, I, think, I think the bigger issue is much more to do with questioning whether a test or a treatment is necessary and also informing patients that actually you need to have this looked at seriously uh, and more attention to be paid on that, which is to do with educating uh, patients. Other aspects of shared decision support, I think it is really in the interaction between patient and provider. And my experience as a clinician, but also from the research is the tremendous spectrum in preferences in patients. Some patients don't want to know, they want to hand over the decision. That was me the other week. I said, look, just don't tell me what you're going to do to the foot. Just do it, and uh, it'll hurt less. And I'm very glad they didn't tell me. I had no idea what metal is in there. They pulled something out the other day. I'm very glad I didn't know. Other patients want to know fine detail about what's going to be done, when it's going to be done. There are big, big differences in preference. And uh, if there is information and technology that can be used uh, and can be targeted to the different patients' preferences, I, th I think that's an important area. I, I think you've, you've asked a really interesting question. Um, in a previous life, I was involved in teaching communication skills to doctors. Um, and a number of things kind of amaze you is that, exactly as you say, you get amazed at the number of highly intelligent and questioning people when it comes to healthcare <coughs> become passive. And there are, a number of, there are a good number of psychological reasons for that, but we need to recognise it. But that basically means is when you enter the front door of this big building that says Sausage Factory, we shouldn't be surprised when sausages come out the other end. Because in Scotland, we found that we had a group of people called surgeons, an interesting psychological study in themselves. Um, a lot of surgeons like to operate. Why not? So um, are you actually getting the conser conservative treatment advice, or are you actually increasing the propensity to operate? And we found there were differences between individual surgeons and so on and so forth. We also found that when we actually educated patients by giving them some basic easy to understand uh, information, it actually changed the outpatient uh, result um, in orthopaedic clinics. Because it wasn't so much that the surgeons were doing anything wrong in inverted commas, but they also had a communication mismatch where they actually believed that a lot of the patients expected to have an operation. And a lot of us have a driver of liking to be liked, and add that the fact that you like actually destroying things and trying to put them together again, you have got a self-fulfilling prophecy. So giving people permission to basically say, it's okay not to have an operation, and here is the evidence, allowed us to move our consultations forward, and in the areas where we deployed that, it actually reduced knee surgery. Um, so significant. I, I think the real, the real challenge is for patients looking for information, where do they go to get authoritative but understandable information that's pitched to, to their needs? I think the British NHS has done some, have, have got some very good website and information that, so, uh, you know, I think I lead the world in, in the information and simplicity and way they've put, put it together. Yeah, and we've, we've invested in that. And one of the, the web services my organization runs is called NHS Inform. Yeah. Um, and that is we provide all patients safe facing health information and advice. So it's consistent, it's evidence-based, and I've got a team of 32 who simply govern that information to make sure it's up to date and relevant. So mm -hmm. when you go to your family doctor, if you're wanting information about your inhaler, they will download that information off that website. Whereas in the past, you used to get a, a drug leaf reflet that was on the shelf of the GP surgery, and it probably been there for two or three years. Then when you went to the pharmacist, you got slightly different information, mm. and you went onto the website, something different again. So what a lot of patients did, they didn't take anything. So by moving into that, that way of, of single source, you're right, has made a significant difference for us. Thank you.
No, we're, we're coming upon uh, the uh, uh, lunch hour. Uh, any uh, additional questions? I'd uh, like to thank uh, John and uh, George uh, for your, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Um, I'm Thomas Leludek from uh, France Health Authority. First, uh, thank you very much for your inspiring uh, conference. Um, may I ask to George Crooks uh, if your organization, NHS Scotland, had or will conduct medical or economic assessment uh, for uh, uh, IT in uh, healthcare system? Uh, yes. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, we're doing that. We're, we're doing a number of economic evaluations, some through um, our academic um, colleagues um, in the Health Economic Research Unit at the University of Aberdeen, uh, but also our government um, external auditors called Audit Scotland have been uh, doing uh, independent audits of our ICT, and there, in fact, is a published uh, Audit Scotland report um, on telehealth, uh, which is, which is e easy to access on the web, and I can give you the link afterwards. Yes. Well, I'd like to make a comment concerning your discussion on shared decision-making. Um, first of all, I would like to say that we have two parts of the equation. Uh, the first part is the part of medicine, and the second one is the part of the patient. Um, first of all, talking about the first part of the equation, I'm talking about medicine. Uh, most of the time, at least from uh, the era of Hippocrates, we have considered medicine as uh, an art of applying incomplete knowledge. And the second part of the equation, the part of the patient, is a part which has are uh, less more information than the previous part of the equation, meaning the doctor. So that's a very complicated topic. And uh, talking about shared decision making, what we have in mind and what we should bear in mind is that we have introduced preferences for the provider and the patient, and except for that, even for the society. So that's a very complicated topic. And when you um, introduce uh, health technology, that's a very, very important topic. So that's a very new topic. It's a kind of utility, but not the way we have understood the utility theory so far, at least in macroeconomics. I didn't say my name. It's Anastasios Mundjoglu. I'm coming from Greece. I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Quality and Reliable Electronic Healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Um, well, I know... So I know a number of patients who know more about their disease and the treatments than the doctors that are uh, treating them. And that's without, um, um, I've, I've got a PhD student with Parkinson's and she knows much more than her physician and explains it to me. I, I think the internet has both positive and negative sides. It's, it's, I think one of the most positive is bringing patients together the website Patients Like Us has teamed up with researchers and, um, as it were, they're doing it for themselves uh, and becoming, in some ways, independent. There are some downsides of that. Um, but I, I think the future is, is with patients learning about their disease and treatments. And the issue is how they learn... Um, from the best information rather than from the worst, which is often commercially sponsored. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, move on to lunch. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.